Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us uh, on streaming. I am Tabe from CCBT. Allow me to explain about the CCBT. CCB Creative Base Tokyo, CCBT, is uh, offering the communication between the diverse people, and this is a very short, uh, intensive, uh, future-oriented workshop is being offered at here. And 20 selected participants are here, and they are joining to add more skill sets. So this is a group work of six days. And this is the third round of uh, this opportunity. And the theme is inclusive design. We started this yesterday. And we have visited some social welfare workshops and did some workshops. And this is our day two. Camp program director Ito-san and Raira-san will introduce about this camp and then move over to the keynote speech. Ito-san, Raira-san, please. I have to speak about very intellectual things, so I am going to speak in English. I need to speak like a very smart person. I'm very nervous. Hello, Hello everyone. <laughs> Welcome to Future Allegations Camp. Uh, in this project, we are, it's a kind of first uh, project of its kind where social welfare organizations and designers together through the period of six days create viable design solutions uh, for the design partners uh, for, for the foreseeing future. Uh, the reason why we're doing this is that there are over 5,000 social welfare workshops in Japan, each of which have different types of disabilities or forms of care that they need to provide. And throughout the years, throughout the uh, changes of laws and uh, uh, government procedures, many social welfare workshops are left to their own devices to provide financial stability and uh, societal kind of connections and vital care for the people that uh, use these facilities. And so for this workshop, uh, through collaboration with designers, we're trying to find ways of the design partners, the social welfare organizations, to create forms of design solutions that can be adapted to their environment as well as the wider public. Uh, so it's a really challenging task that we set ourselves, but um, throughout these uh, from yesterday onwards, uh, we have been kind of structuring this process, this roadmap, as it were. And today is the second day. We've just come up with our kind, we've just visited the social welfare organizations. We've come up with lots of questions that we should, what should we answer, and lots of kind of ideas. And we're in the process of trying to structure the core of these uh, design questions. And today we have a special guest <laughs> to join us uh, to ho hopefully help our participants to define and structure the core of what they are trying to answer. Okay, so today's special guest and lecturer is Julia Kasim. And uh, I call her uh, the mother of inclusive design. <laughs> no. And she's going to uh, do the idea and the inspirational talk about uh, how to create a good design question and how it lead uh, to the good the inclusive uh, process and the design solutions. And uh, please uh, learn and, and enjoy about her lecture and thinking about a more inclusive world. So please uh, give a talk. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Julius. Please. First of all, 
Um, I'd like to thank the CCBT for inviting me to be part of this really exciting initiative and for the opportunity to talk about an area of design in which I've been active even before I knew what to call it. Um, my old boss at the RCA, Roger Coleman, coined the term inclusive design in 1994. Uh, at a time when I was still in Japan, working with visually impaired people to improve cognitive access to museum collections. I went back to the UK in 1998 and joined him at the RCA, working with wonderful design partners with disabilities who taught me so much about how not to exclude because the opposite of inclusion by design is exclusion by design. Uh, in this workshop, you will be working primarily uh, with design partners from the world of disability. But I want you to understand that inclusive design is not about disability alone. Rather, it's a process which can be used to great effect in other intractable uh, situations too. For the past uh, seven years, I've been working with the wonderful weaving communities in Kyotango and Nishijin. They're facing really se uh, serious issues of survival in a world where few people wear kimono or obi. How to preserve their incredible skills base, yet innovate for the future using design as a tool. Um, it's here that an inclusive process comes into its own, for it allows new dialogues and the product scenarios that emerge from them that would otherwise not be possible. In an inclusive process, everyone wins. When I first started working with visually impaired people and museum collections in 1984, I thought I knew about art because that was my training. I didn't. I didn't know how to look. They taught me, visually impaired people taught me to do that. Since then, my mantra has been this. By understanding the extreme scenario, you can innovate for the mainstream too. I'm sure that you will all experience that during the course of this workshop. Extreme scenarios are always a stimulus for new creative ideas. Now in any <clears throat> presentation I give on inclusive design in Japan, the first question I'm always asked is, what is the difference between universal design and inclusive design? I thought about this a great deal and feel that there are three major differences of emphasis, which are primarily due to the particular context in which inclusive de design developed as a design movement. Firstly, that inclusive de design takes a much more nuanced um, uh, uh, approach to understanding the implications of population diversity. And as a result, a more nuanced approach to the nature of design exclusion. Thirdly, that inclusive design is process driven, not guideline driven, as has been the case for universal design in Japan. Universal design guidelines allied to a, an inclusive process have been responsible for brilliant examples of both, of both inclusive design and universal design, like the Nanakuma line uh, in Fukuoka, or the brilliant washlet toilet. The original concept for which entered Japan in 1971, the year I came here, um, and it came 
as a piece of disability kit for hospitals, but was totally transformed by our friends at Toto and Inax, now Lixil. Okay? But guidelines alone do not guarantee good design, like this horrendous UD mountain in Nagasaki, or this guide dog toilet in Okinawa at a museum where there were no other services for visually impaired visitors, but at least the guide dogs had a toilet. UD guidelines may help with the basics, but if you do not understand how and why people are excluded, it will be difficult to envisage new possibilities. I've listed here some of the major ways in which design exclusion can occur. Physical exclusion, sensory exclusion, linguistic and cognitive exclusion, emotional exclusion, digital exclusion, service exclusion, social exclusion, and economic exclusion. Today, I will only deal with four that I believe are really relevant to the context for which you will be designing. Linguistic exclusion, cognitive exclusion, emotional exclusion, and digital exclusion. Now, the challenge for our increasing, increasingly diverse societies today was beautifully expressed by the Indian poet Rabindra Tagore. The problem, he said, is not how to wipe out all differences, but how to unite them with the differences intact. And I would add to that by saying that if you use an inclusive process, diversity can be a powerful means to find new ways of approaching old problems. This is a photo of my primary school class taken in 1954, exactly 70 years ago. Um, that's me, age seven, um, circled red. You could not take that photo today in the UK. In 2010, the census for England and Wales showed that 9% or one in 10 of all relationships were inter-ethnic. My own family has taken that route. Four of us have partners from elsewhere. Mine is Sri Lankan, my sister's is from Egypt, my brother, is, his wife is from Italy, and my youngest sister's uh, uh, husband is from Greece. It was unusual then, but not anymore. Japan, too, is becoming increasingly diverse with a record high of 3,075,213 foreign residents in 2022, an increase of 11.4% from the year before. And the companion of population diversity um, of this kind and if you're not careful, is linguistic and cognitive exclusion. How do you manage your life when you cannot read or write, like these two ladies I met in Shanghai, who described the impact of being illiterate on them? They lived in a cash-only world, could not read maps, and were fearful of taking the bus or the subway. They were also excluded from many available services provided by the public services because of their inability to read or write. Which leads me to the next point in your inclusive design uh, journey. Whatever you design in the next few days will require what I call a primary interface. Uh, I call it a primary interface because it's, um, 
it's it's it is what you uh, it's it's um, because it is what you uh, the interface is what you initially interact with in order to whether it's a product a service a system a piece of communication that is the thing that you first interact with in order to go to the next step. Now the dictionary definition of an interface is the point at which two systems, objects, organizations meet and interact, or a device or program that allows a user to communicate with a computer. But I'm not talking about computers alone. This is a photo of a betting ticket for the horse races in Japan, okay, with the list of the races behind it. Now, the problem is that if you don't understand the underlying system of betting and how it works, even if you can read what's on the ticket, it means nothing because you cannot cognitively access the service. Um, it's a similar situation um, for the lady of restricted growth uh, in the pink jacket in the middle uh, of this picture, which I took in Dublin. She cannot reach the control panel of the ATM uh, because of her height. But it's the primary service to the, to the primary interface to the service it offers. And as a result, she's not only physically excluded, but she's also excluded from the service that the ATM offers. Frustrating. So design exclusion can be multifaceted, not just one type. Which leads me to the next one. Um, emotional exclusion, uh, which many of the members of the organizations you'll be working with um, experience daily. I took this picture in a Tel Aviv market. This lady comes to the market each day because she lives alone and is lonely. Sitting on her chair like this, it's unlikely that anyone will speak to her. But they do, for the simple reason that she has cleverly created a primary interface for herself that will allow her to interact with others. This is her primary interface, her dog. Um, it was the same for me when I moved to Akita two years ago and knew nobody. But I have a dog um, and a neighbor, Makizawa-san, who lost his wife several years ago and lives alone. He saw me taking my dog, Rusty, for a walk, so I invited him to join me. Makizawa-san is smart. He knew that going on daily work walks with a foreign lady in Akita might cause gossip in the neighborhood. So he equipped himself with a pair of tongs and a bag for the rubbish he collects as we walk, and this is his alibi and his interface. Um, it's a win-win situation for both of us, and we have become firm friends. Rusty is my primary interface, while Makizawa-san's is his pair of tongs. So um, when you're designing, um, uh, when you're designing a, your concept, I think you have to um, Create a primary interface of this kind that will kickstart community engagement, but also demonstrate mutual benefit. It's what I call the quid pro quo factor, and one that you should consider for your final design idea. What is the benefit in this idea for me, for us, for our team? What is the benefit in it for our design partners? Are the ambitions 
and self-interest of both parties balanced? Is equivalence of ambition ensured? So this is called the quid pro quo factor. I made it up, okay? But I think it's a really important consideration when you are designing inclusively. In Seoul, um, I saw a wonderful example on a bigger scale of how this has evolved naturally where everyone benefits, Seoul City, the general public, and the lonely men themselves. This is Pagoda Park in Insadong, South Korea, um, which has a memorial to the Korean War. When we went there, we noticed that the, the park was full of men of a certain age. Um, even the number of toilets reflected this. There were only two for women, and all the rest were for men. Why? So we talked to this man in a green vest on, on the right, and he told us why he came to the park. He was retired. There was no place for him at home where he was made to feel like Sodai Gumi. He had no desire to go to the day center in his apartment community whose activities he found boring. And he said, I'm not old. And since he had a free travel pass from Seoul City, he came to the park every day so that he could make friends on his own terms. Many of the other men were in his position so that they had organized themselves to pick up the garbage in the park, and it was his turn to supervise that day, hence the green vest. So a question you should ask yourselves is, what is the primary interface of our idea or mechanism, and will it achieve something like this? Later in the presentation, I'll give you a range of other examples of mechanisms and primary interfaces of this type. Um, but before I, that, I wanted to talk briefly about digital exclusion because I feel that in many workshops, the automatic response by the design team to any design issue is to create yet another app. Um, and I hope this won't be the case for this workshop. Um, as a member of the pre-digital generation, like the people in this picture, I feel it's important for you as digital natives to understand that many good solutions lie outside the world of the smartphone, outside of the world of the app. Digital exclusion is very real for large parts of the population. Um, in the UK, where I'm from, in 2018, 8% or 4.3 million people in the UK had no basic digital skills. Um, in 2025, it's estimated that 7.9 million people will lack, that's a tenth of the population, will lack digital skills. And the context for which you, designing, you are designing is actually really analog. You have to understand the different mental models on which people base their understanding of how you interact with things or systems or services. There's a huge conceptual difference between a smartphone and a landline phone. The landline phone is based on a linear set of actions and resulting effects. You pick up the receiver, you dial the number, you speak, and then you put the phone down when you've finished. Simple. That is, it's a linear set of transactions. That is not what you do with a smartphone. A smartphone is an alien to a non-digital native. 
And we use it, if we use it, in very primitive ways. Is it a product? Is a smartphone a product? Or is it just an interface on a surface uh, to a service via an app? Um, to illustrate the difficulties we experience, this is a photo I took on a Lufthansa plane um, of the controller to the entertainment system. This is the back of it. This is the front. I had no idea what to do. There was no button. Fortunately, a 12-year-old boy who was sitting next to me showed me immediately. He understood, he immediately identified that that small square, surrounded by yellow, um, was a touchpad, not a button. His mental model of interaction was different from mine. As the great Naoto Fukuzawa did with this CD player that he designed for Muji, um, it's what he did was he provided an alternative means of interacting. So when you're thinking of your design solution, think about providing different levels of engaging. So I think it's time really to give you some case studies of um, inclusive design as a process. And I think the first thing that you have to understand is, to un is that you must understand and interrogate the context, as you've been doing in the workshop today and yesterday, uh, yesterday and today. Um, how do you do that? Well, I think it's simple by observation, by asking the right questions, listening before you discuss, and above all, documentation through images, and notes, okay? Um, notes alone are just not enough. Um, it's because when you take photos and videos, when you look at them afterwards, you notice the gap between the reality and what is being told to you. Um, and think this that was, wasn't apparent at the time. Um, so, what are the questions you should ask? Well, here are some you could start with. You've already done the first one. What are your dreams? Small and big, short term, medium term, long term. What are the strong points, the benefits and the advantages of the organization and the people there? What existing and potential resources can you use what are the weak points? How can we overcome them creatively? Um, I'm going to show you two case studies to illustrate how other designers have approached con challenging contexts and the design questions they ended up addressing. Um, the first was in Shanghai, and the theme of the workshop was invisible people. I asked the students, to find design partners who were generally invisible to them. So this is Team Brick of fourth year industrial design students at Tsinghua University. They identified a group of construction workers um, on a site behind the university. They lived eight to a room in this dormitory building in conditions that were not great. Each worker was given two pairs of work gloves per month of really poor quality that were quickly ruined, but they could not afford to buy new ones. An analysis of the damage showed where to concentrate their idea. A pair of damaged gloves could be used to reinforce the new pair. The second student's idea focused on how to make washing clothes easier 
There was no washing machine in the building. So they showed them a simple process and methodology of soaking the clothes in a bucket first and using materials that were to hand. They created a washer from pet bottles and a stick. And this is the design recipe. And this is the video, oh, which should be working. There it is. So um, in order to frame their design concept, like you, each group here, the students had to first of all ask to design, frame their design questions. So the first one they asked really was quite practical. How can we use what they already have uh, to improve the quality of their lives, their living environment? The second was longer, longer term. How can we demonstrate a practical process of resolving problems using simple design methods, ones that can then lead to new ways of dealing with other challenges? Okay? So the first was practical. The second was process-related. Okay? And your questions can be about process as well. Okay? Um, so, and, uh, so the second case study is um, between 2009 and 2016, um, I ran a series of workshops in three countries of the former Yugoslavia, um, Croatia, Bosnia-Herzegovina, and what is now North Macedonia. So the f one I'm going to show you centered on a school, for a vocational school for hearing impaired students which had once been really large when Yugoslavia was united, but was now completely under-resourced um, with less than 50 students who were trained to gain employment in skills in IT, woodwork, and sewing. The designers worked in three teams. The facilities were really basic. Um, this is the wood workshop, which was poorly equipped, and it had very few basic, even hand tools. So the designers, designers decided that rather than designing anything new, they would create a basis for future activity. Uh, they decided to show the students how to create a toolkit of their own using existing resources. Plans were found online. We brought in local carpenters to show them how to make and operate the existing, make the tools and operate the existing equipment. And then the students learnt by doing. Um, four basic tools were created. The tools were color coded with manuals created for them. And the final thing they made was a workbench with drawers to house the tools in. This meant that when the students graduated, they were already equipped, but importantly, could make tools, of new tools, to generate income. Okay? Um, the second team concentrated on felt, which is a very common traditional material in North Macedonia. Paper templates were made, products made out of them, and we, we decided that they would be products which required three levels of skill. This is the first basic level, cutting. The second ca category was games.
while the third required instruction from a felt expert. And this was really a new way of showing felt as a material, okay? Um, so this is the process. And it's rolled like makizushi. <laughs> <laughs> it's laid over a bucket. And then four lamps were created and each was given a really nice name, okay? So please give a great name to your project. Um, but I think the, the important part about felt is that making can be a communication interface with the broader community, which was vital for the hearing impaired students who were quite cut off. So here we have both a product being made, but also a communication interface in its own right being created. Okay? So I want you to think about this is the primary interface in the sense of the felt. Um, and so what were, the, uh, what were the design questions asked by the felt team? Well, how can we draw on existing traditional skill, skills in felting to create new products and new possibilities for it as a material? And then the second was, how can we build skills in the students using making as a means of communication and income generation? Now this morning, we talked about creating design questions and you've created your design questions. Maybe they'll change, I don't know. Possibly they will. Um, but they'll definitely be refined. Um, but the reason why design questions are important is that they are in many ways a way of framing the big picture for your design idea and for enabling you to keep a focus on what it is that you're actually trying to achieve. Workshops like these are really intense experiences with a huge overload of information and the need for quick decision making. So design questions are really helpful enabling you to come back to what it is that you're actually trying to achieve at those times when you're getting kind of lost in the, in the woods of information overload. Um, my advice too, and what you will actually be doing, is coming up with three ideas. Because it's by interrogating those three ideas simultaneously, it will enable you to clarify which is the best one to pursue. Sometimes you find that one question which you thought was really great is actually a sub-question of the main one. Okay, so think, interrogate those design questions really well um, because the time spent on that speeds up the design process. Um, now there's a principle in philosophy, utilitarian philosophy, called the greatest good and least harm principle. I feel it's a good one to follow for designers too. Uh, to frame. So here are some of the questions that you could potentially ask. Who is our design solution actually aimed at? What will be the implications uh, and impact of our proposed solution? While benefiting one group, will it actively exclude another? Will it be affordable? or achievable by those for whom it's intended? And can it survive af without our help after we've gone? What will be its impact on the existing context? And this is a really important one for all of the teams to ask, given the contexts that you're working in. Will staff beneficiary communication be enhanced? And in what way? Will community engagement be enhanced? And how? 
Is our idea just a quick fix, or can it lead to further initiatives? And if so, what are those initiatives? So once you have your idea, you can then have to come up with the mechanism of delivery. Now, Ito-san and I discussed how to translate mechanism, okay? Um, it's shikumi. shikumi. Yeah. Um, but it's the way, the, the means by which you deliver your idea. And it can be the primary interface at the same time, okay? So you have a primary interface and a mechanism, all right? Um, uh, once you... Uh, I'm going to show you some really impactful ones. Now, today, from today, at the building over the road, SWING, which is a wonderful um, initiative in Kyoto, um, are having an exhibition. Go and see it. SWING has come up with some fantastic mechanisms for community engagement for their beneficiaries, which are long. This is, they dress as superheroes and collect garbage in the neighborhood. Okay, that's just one of them. Um, here's another one. This is the slow checkout lane. Um, in the Netherlands, um, there is a supermarket. Now, of course, it's the uh, self-checkout. But actually, for a lot of people, the supermarket is one of the first, the only places where they can engage, okay, with someone else. They, often it's the only person they talk to in a day. So they've created, to great success, these slow checkout lanes where the cashier will talk to you. Simple. It's a really simple mechanism. Really simple, but it's very meaningful. Um, at the Dulwich Picture Gallery in London, um, my dear friend Gillian Wolfe has introduced many pioneering initiatives. One that I particularly like is something called Art on Prescription. Now, this is a collaboration with the national charity, Age UK, the National Health Service, which is our national medical system, and the gallery itself. And it's a brilliantly simple idea. Local GPs, the local doctors, identify patients who come to them who are suffering more from loneliness than anything physical. And they give their patients a prescription for art, a prescription for a visit to the Dulwich Picture Gallery. There, they can have a simple visit or they can take part in community workshops. Often these involve children from local schools. So the primary, the mechanism is the prescription, but behind it is the network of collaboration, okay? And that will be, you must also think about in your ideas, what is the network behind our idea that can support what we do? Um, another, um, but I think that uh, the, the, and the other thing that I think these really illustrate is an, another question that you should add to your list. How can we repurpose existing community activities or interfaces in a similar way? Um, taking what exists already, but adding your own creative possibility. Japan has got this massive public infrastructure of facilities, you know, which are aging and underutilized, okay? Um, the, my favorite one was San San Saichi in Chioda, you know, but there are many more. So look at, look at the community in which the, the, the activity, your, your, uh, your, uh, um, your organization is cited and see what is there that is not being is underutilized. How can we repurpose it? Okay, um, and it can be quite simple things. Here's, this is um, uh, decommissioned telephone boxes in the UK, which have been transformed into community book exchanges and also food banks. Um, 
So in this case, people bring their unwanted books and swap them for others. Um, but does it have to be books? Could it be something else? Okay. Um, could it be the gacha gacha? <laughs> um, the UK has a history of allotments, which are, are public, under, underutilized growing spaces managed by the, by the town. Um, now, these, where it's their public areas where people can grow vegetables and fruit. And they've been a major place for community enhancements since many immigrants grow ingredients for the food that they love, which they cannot find in supermarkets. This is my local one in Akita. Um, but I think beyond allotments, city dwellers have taken in, the, in London have taken to guerrilla gardening on small, abandoned, or poorly cared for spaces as a means of community engagement. Okay? Um, this, is bef this is one before on the left and after on the right. Okay? Um, and I'm sure you know about the Eki Piano, but perhaps you don't know its history. So I'll tell you its history. Um, it started in 2003 in Sheffield, in the north of England, uh, when someone moved house. And they couldn't get their piano up the stairs. Um, they left it on the street with an invitation for people to play it. Um, and this became a, a trend, but it resulted in legal issues, like the guerrilla gardening. Okay. Uh, so in 2008, the artist Luke Jerram, he placed one on the South Bank in London outside the Royal Festival Hall, which is a big concert hall, um, as a challenge to the prohibition of playing music in public spaces. Um, but the idea caught on, and between 2018 and 2020, Play Me, I'm Yours street pianos were in 70 cities worldwide. And you know about them because NHK does a program on them. Okay? But I think the next step is that last year, um, a TV program in the UK by Channel 4 caught the imagine of everyone. It was a competition for the best amateur piano player uh, on street pianos, and it was won by um, uh, it was won by the blind and neurodivergent Lucy, whom you can see here playing Chopin. I hope this works. No, doesn't work. Look at it on YouTube. It's absolutely wonderful. Okay. Um, so, really, to end um, uh, my final slide is, is really to do with what I think was always my best idea, okay? This was taken in 1988, I think, um, on Halloween. And when Lila was three years old, th I think she was three, she still couldn't walk. We had, just, we had moved to Nagoya from Tokyo, and we were faced with the challenge of creating a community of friends for children like my own, particularly Lila, who could not walk at the time and was disadvantaged in terms of socialization. So I talked to a friend who had twins of the same age. We hired a room in the basement of the block of flats where we lived um, and started a weekly playgroup for bicultural children. It still exists Third, all these years later uh, and still meets on Wednesdays at the same place and the room is still booked in my name even though I no longer live there. Okay? Um, and I think that it illustrates that um, good ideas will survive and they'll take journeys of their own. They'll thrive and take journeys of their own. So... Good luck with your design ideas. And if you need any more information on how to design by including, then buy my book or ask me. Thank you very much.
Thanks, Mum, literally <laughs> <laughs> and laterally. <laughs> Thank you very much for the good presentations. Yeah, I think yeah. we're we're trying to process what questions to ask now. I think it will take a bit of time. And uh, I think in the uh, audience, you hear the Japanese and English both, so maybe your brain's a little bit yeah. <laughs> too hot. <laughs> okay, a little bit calm down, but uh, uh, in the lecture, there's a lot of uh, critical uh, questions to the participants, our campers here, and also a lot of hints, like uh, thinking about primary interface to the mechanism or uh, questioning, the meaning of questioning uh, itself, and thinking about resources of your partner or in a society. Mm. I think that's really uh, this stimulate your brain a lot of inspiration now. So we're going to have question and answer or discussion session from now on. Uh, if there's some question in the audiences, uh, oh, one comment. Uh, if you have questions in the audience, you can say in Japanese. Eh, 会場で質問がある方は日本語でお話しいただいて構いません。同時通訳で英語にトランスで。We have in simultaneous interpretation, so you can ask either Japanese or English. You can, you know, express your feelings as well. Comment as well. However, please demarcate whether that is a question or comment. So, when you speak in Japanese, maybe easy for the audience to understand. Presentation. I am very my my heart is moving. Thank you so much. <laughs> So oh, I have the two question and the one comment. So yeah, one more. Okay, so the first one. Okay, so let me speak in English. So one question. So if you have any other any other mental disabilities for for product, so. So I, I received uh, your uh, presentation for focus on the so neurodiversity or any other physical disabilities. But uh, do you have any other the 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 uh, ma tatoeba le le to stay as for example, so the mental uh, disease or the disabilities? Do you have any specific questions or ideas you can share with us? Oh, sorry, I'll do it in Japanese, no, in English. Um, I think, in, in a sense, creating products is relatively simple, okay? You do an assessment of the skills in your team, the understanding of the context in which you're working, the needs of the context in which you're working, and the, you tend to design from there, as in the two examples I showed you, okay? Um, but I think in, with Seishin Shogai, there's, with uh, uh, mental health issues, um, I think often it's the product is not the most important thing, okay? In other words, what, are you looking for a product that will enable, will comfort, or enable a person with a mental health issue to communicate, to socialize, to do something. So is it going to be a product or is it going to be something else? Okay, so I can't answer in terms of specific products. That with um, autism, with autism there is a, um, a movement of snooslin rooms, yeah. And they're sensory environments which enable um, uh, and if you go to Kansai Kuko, there's actually one in Kansai Kuko, surprisingly. Um, Kansai Kuko? Kansai Kuko, yes. Kansai Kuko, yes. Um, but um, so you, you have very specific areas of design which concentrate on particular neurodivergence, okay? 
And the Snooslin rooms are really, and there are lots of really good individual designers who are involved in that. Um, but as far as mental health issues uh, are concerned, I think it's really a very much a case-by-case -case, uh, basis. Sorry. That's your first question. <laughs> yeah, very, very important mm. for the sort of, But by the way, if you know that so at the quiet room in this uh, behind uh, this area, so mm. could, please uh, quickly check. Yeah. So, <laughs> and the second, uh, my question. So, I really love to do this, uh, this presentation of the art of presentation. Art uh, show Yes. Presentation. Uh, art uh, prescription. Uh, propose for the so who is who is who is uh, proposed the so at the presentation for the people mental health or uh, no this was um Gillian Wolf um uh, she is a very uh, she's a museum educator okay and the Dulwich pic to whom to whom yeah to whom to whom and who visit doctors uh, because it's, you know, uh, uh, but the real problem is not the illness, it's actually loneliness. So really the art by prescription was a means by which they could create a mechanism to enable people to engage with the local community via the Dulwich picture, the, the, the art museum. Yeah, and they used a prescription, the format of a prescription uh, because it's, uh, how do you say, rather than saying you should go and do this, they gave an actual prescription which the gallery had, was linked to the gallery, okay? So it was a kikake, you know, it was basically a means by which people could engage in a format, format and a template that they understood, that this was kusuri, but it was kusuri for the soul, not for the body. So in case of uh, nearly case of in, can, in case of Japan, so Japan, some of the loneliest audiences going to the izakaya or uh, majan yes. area or any other at uh, billiard area. So 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 in case of Japan, ma, ma loneliest audiences well, go. But then on then the other side, loneliest obasan is cannot going to out. But there is a very good good one of the example. I am really love it. Mm. Yeah. yeah, vending machines. I, well, vending machine places where there are in shopping malls where there are vending machines and s seating are often a place where uh, people feel that they can go freely, like the old men in the park in Korea. Okay, uh, because the vending machine. The drinks are cheaper than going to a kisaten, okay? Uh, and they can also, the idea that they can have serendipitous, uh, I don't know how, serendipitous in, in, they can make friends on their terms, not on the terms of the gyose, is really important, okay? So this is not a daycare center. This is a space which is like a free space, a library, is a free space. A museum should be a free space. And there are a lot of really interesting initiatives in public libraries in different places where people have stopped reading books, but they have transformed library spaces into um, places for making, places for communicating, places for performing, and so on. So, the, the, the evolution of public libraries now is really interesting to study, okay? Because they are free spaces, if you see what I mean. So when you're repurposing um, community facilities, I think you have to see, is this a free space? In other words, is it a space that belongs to everyone? Or is this a space which belongs to particular, uh, you know, uh, a company or which is controlled in some way, okay? Um, Thank you very much. It's a wonderful yeah. 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 So I mean, it's why I like yeah, the yeah. guerrilla gardening, I think, is great yeah, because yeah, good, good, yeah, yeah. unlike Japan, the UK, there's garbage everywhere and those, 
those tiny plots of green space, um, they become a symbol of something different to the environment. And when they started creating these guerrilla uh, garden spaces, they did it at night time uh, because they didn't, the police, it's public property, okay? It's public property, and therefore it's their property, but it's not their property. It's controlled by some statutory body. Yes, okay. okay. So, but the thing is that once the effects were known, then it became supported, okay? And that's often the case with initiatives like that, that if it's a good idea, people will understand that it's a good idea, okay? And not a challenge to authority, okay? あちょっとすごい難しいことをちょっと聞くのでちょっと日本語で今まで難しいことを聞きましたけどいやすごいその私自身は So let me speak in Japanese、uh, because I'd like to ask a very complicated part So I well in order to create sort of the sort of supporting tools to support those、uh, psychologically or mentally、uh, neuropsycho、uh, neuro Uh, neural system sort of、uh, damaged people or impaired people. And then for that, why I'd like to think about sort of study abroad and so forth. But to find out the pathway to、uh, resolve those issues is that either product the material, sorry, create the material for those patients or people, or the education system to be explored or the provided more system. But the issue. Rather than understand their sort of disease system or the situations, rather you should think about what you can do together with them, and then based on understanding, then you can find a way. No, sorry. I see. So the, I have to find out the sort of prime,、um, the trigger, and first contact point, and then I can think about the primary. Interface and then form like more idea towards the updated idea. So I should start with something and then based on that、um, baseline, I should explore further. So the felt project in Macedonia, we actually、uh, found out the communication evolved in a course of、uh, co creation and working together. But the first, most important thing is that. The communication along with the working together. We always are pressured that we need to sell or need to be consumed. But the process towards the solution building or communication in that process is very important. That is. Okay, good discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, any other comments or questions? Ah, there's one. Ah, there's more. <laughs> Three people. Thank you for reaching and good time. Sorry, allow me to speak in English. A question the potential resource and the context. I would like to know some tips to find that out. So,、uh, Rizika Lane is、uh, my, one of my favorite. There is a context that you need to do it quickly. But、uh, the cashier, the slow cashier, but potential resource understanding, or in what context you see that. Existing process would probably allow you to come up with different solutions. So I would like to be more skilled in that way. You know, how should I look at the same thing? Is that from the resource or from context? Some context could be a barrier to come up with new solution. But do you have any tips for us to, you know, find out the right way to look at these? Oh, the, uh, this kind of uh, tip, any tips to think about reframe uh, the uh, existing resources? Because, like this、uh, slow, check lane, ch slow checkout lane idea is already existing, but it's a completely opposite side of idea because normally uh, slow uh, check lane should be fast. You have to、mm. map them. Map. Map. Mapping. 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 M
to, you map you map your resource, you map what you have, okay, in a very simple way. So what do we have? What don't we have? What skills do we have? Okay, what works? What doesn't work? Okay, and you map it visually. Um, use a big wall, okay? Don't use post-its. I hate <laughs> post-its, okay? Um, but use it, um, and then what you can do is by looking, looking at this, in a sense, this is the landscape. This is our landscape of operation. You can then start saying, right, this works. This doesn't actually work. And maybe we can combine this one and this one as, as a, diff a different activity. Yeah. So I think yeah. mapping is, the, is a really, it's a really um, useful way, particularly mm. visual mapping, you know, mm. Um, is a very useful way of, uh, how do you say, uh, evaluating ideas and then joining them. It's, it's similar to mind mapping. Yeah. It's very similar to mind mapping as a, an activity. So for the slow lane, I think what the important thing is, it's not just about otoshiori ni yasashi sa. It's kind to the old people. That is not the concept, ni, not the only concept in the supermarket because customer satisfaction is important but also employee <laughs> satisfaction trying for the employee, employee to stay in that job is also very important so just kind of so just saying okay we need to like do sekyaku faster doesn't solve the other problem of trying to engage Employ, uh, employees and give value and give to value the, to their work to an activity which yeah. is actually quite boring. quite boring and I suspect I, I didn't design this so I don't know but if you ask the employees what's the most fun part of your job they will not say dejiuchi they will say okyakusan to issho ni kaiwa shiteru toki they will say when they are communicating with the customer of the customer which is loneliness Mm -hmm. And uh, there are a lot of uh, old, uh, especially... There are a lot of young, lonely people, young, too. Yeah. So, so, um, so. So, but uh, I'm just thinking in terms of like yeah. chiho, mm -hmm. you know, where from the, from the hours of, say, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., there are a lot of elderly customers who are quite lonely. So come, come out. The shopping is an excuse for them to come out and have a conversation. So it's about balancing the two sides, you know, one the provider quick, and the receiver. Yeah, one quick comment. Uh, I think after the mapping, important thing is uh, kind of finding the bias. Because you, if you map the resources or your biases, then you find your bias and you can think about what's the opposite side. And tomorrow, we're going to have a really interesting workshop by Kosuke Takahashi-san. <laughs> okay. It's really your answering, and so please, uh, looking forward to the tomorrow's workshop. Yeah, that nice question. Thank you very much. Thank you for everyone. Yeah. Thank you very much. And next question. Actually, I do not have a question, but I have participated in many workshops to date, and I have one question. Inclusive design. I am promoting this uh, inclusive workshop from the first party standpoint. I've been working on this three years, but unfortunately, people around me have not changed their mindset or how we look at our activities. I have two questions. The first being that you shared the case with Macedonia school. Ultimately, that product will be consumed and sold. I would like to ask this process. inclusive design is happening amongst the collaboration so 
hand language, sign language, and the if there are any collaboration with the sign language basis. With designers, so based on the sign language, based the sign language based designing project. If there are any project which has been carried out. Yeah, the first one is uh, the, the he he asked me about the um, what was how, how were the products marketed in Macedonia. No, no, that, that was not the question. Uh, that impressed me very much. Oh, okay, uh, right. And yeah. then after that. Uh, I would like to ask if there are examples where sign language was used as the basic language for um, collaboration with the designers. And uh, we we had a sign interpreter on it. Thank Thank you. The second being, the I am. Are there any person who is running the inclusive design with the deaf people? Are there anyone who is working on this? Anywhere in the world. Probably, uh, but there are also, there are now um, designers, many designers who are actually deaf. Uh, particularly in the UK, there are uh, performers who are deaf, there are designers who are deaf. There's a greater integration, okay, of hearing impaired people in the UK. I don't know any specific examples of um, uh, people doing workshops. Um, and uh, Lila yeah. would be better <laughs> yes, to uh, answer in Japan. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well, firstly, for the uh, deaf, deaf people and the designers engaging, I actually took part in a workshop in 2009 in Sarajevo <laughs> where I worked with deaf uh, reprographic shokunin. And I, I was the English designer visiting Sarajevo trying to solve the problem. I was speaking English. Yeah. There were deaf, inter the deaf workers, and then there were also the local designers from Sarajevo. Sarajevo and also Croatia and, Croatia and, and Serbia. And, Serbia. Yeah. Yeah. and of course we had the interpreters, which was helpful, but after a few days, it was just gesture. Mm. You know, and we created our own sign, <laughs> multilingual sign. Yeah. Anyway, that's just the yodan. <laughs> uh, and uh, for your second question, that I, you probably, I don't know if you know this, there's a, a thing called, initiative called Igengo Rabo. You know? Yes, I know that. So... I do. Hera Rupo is doing that as well. But uh, what is unique about this um, multilingual club is that the deaf and the kind of um, healthy, oh, excuse me, is a uh, regular person are communicating and doing some game together, a question together, and find out the right solution and find the goal together. In that way, it is inclusive. Thank you very much.
thanks. And a nice translation. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, there's one more question, I think, around there. Yeah, yeah she has one question. Um, thank you very much for your talk. Um, my question is about designing inclusive products or services that can get wider adoption. And uh, it may not be the primary intention of inclusive design, but I think uh, to make something truly inc inclusive and also uh, that has longer lifespan, I think it also needs to be adopted by wider audience, like Tortoise Washlet, for example. Mm. So my question is, um, if wider adoption is also an important factor for designing inclusive products or services, uh, what are those factors that can achieve this? If it's not important, um, why? Um, when I first started in this, when I uh, started in this area, um, I was one thing, and when Lila was small, I was shocked by how poorly designed products were for that were aimed at older and disabled people, and it made me very angry because they were ugly, they were stigmatizing, and they were incredibly expensive. So. From the start, um, when I went back to the UK and started working with at the Royal College of Art, um, I worked with the professional design community primarily, and one of the big thrusts was how could I, how could we overcome designers' ideas about disability? Okay, because designers thought that disability and age were massive blocks to creativity. You know, in other words, that if they <laughs> yeah, if they they're still the same that it was everything was dasai and it was difficult and it was horrible, and then so I took two approaches and one approach was to show designers that if you look at design history, particularly communication design history, you'll find that many of the things that we take for granted actually have their roots in disability. So the key, a typewriter, I always use this, the typewriter was created, the first concept for the typewriter was created when Pellegrino Turi, an Italian engineer at the beginning of the 19th century, he had to find a means of communicating with a friend who was blind. So he created the first concept of the typewriter and the carbon paper, okay? Now, when we see our keyboard, we don't think of disability. But if you go through design history, in just look in communication design, so many designs have come as a result of designers or engineers engaging with disability. Okay? So that was the first approach. And the second approach was, when, was showing that you have to balance functionality and aesthetics. In other words, that it is not enough to have something which is functional but deeply stigmatizing and ugly. So how the question, the design question for inclusive design for products particularly is how can we de design something which has all the functional benefits that this community needs um, but at the same time has mainstream aesthetic design values, okay? And if you can bring those two things together, as the washlet has done, it's magic. That's inclusive design magic, okay? And it, it often, it happens, it still happens, but nobody talks about it. Um, Lila drives a Honda Freed, a Freed Plus. Now, the Honda Freed is a brilliantly inclusive um, we're not asking for sponsorship from Honda, by the way. Um, but it's, the reason we chose it was because it's got a very low, it's got a low uh, threshold Boot. at the back. She can wheel her wheelchair into it without a hoist. Okay? It's wide enough to take, uh, wide enough and deep enough for the, whole, um, for the whole car. But Honda never talks about disability. Never. They talk about young families with buggies who like to go camping. With the grandparents. With the grandparents. Yeah. <laughs> okay? So those are all coded messages about, actually, accessibility. And disabled people get the understand immediately. So the thing is that 
Honda's done the right... I wish they would talk more about... But the moment you talk about disability in terms of mainstream product, it's the kiss of death. Okay? So the question is, you know, how can you embed th this kind of functionality, which everybody benefits from? It's not just disabled people. Everybody benefits from it. But the thing is that... You know, you, you, the moment you start talking about it publicly, it becomes a stigma. And that's the really big issue with the way in which products, particularly, are sold and advertised, okay? But it is perfectly possible. And I think that, you know, certainly in the, uh, the years that I've, you know, that I've been active in this area, the number of the understanding of the importance of, uh, how do you say marrying function and aesthetics to produce products that are attractive to all, particularly in an aging society of people who are aging like me, you know, who don't want to have ugly old people kit, okay? So I think that that's, you know, the, it's possible. It's possible, but it's about those two things coming together. We're well on time, so I think we have time for one more question. Or Let it go to the ah. ありがとうございます。ちょっと個人的な質問になってしまうんですけど、え、なんかその違いを抱えたまま、まあ、how we do have to understand ourselves in order to understand the difference. But as we design, I, I think I am talking about my personal topic, and this may not be academic, but personally, I strongly feel this nowadays. How can we understand the difference in accurate manner? I need to think about who I am before I understand the difference. You need to understand yourself in order to understand the difference. So if there are any tips or advices, how can I understand who I am? If you have any advice, <laughs> I'm sorry. I just get involved. Just, just get involved. I mean, my interest in inclusive design or my passion about it came because of Lila. I had to deal. Uh, you know, when you uh, have a disabled child, you understand how really badly designed the world is, how inconvenient and badly designed it is. And it just makes you angry. So, Ira, Ira, where, where is your Ira? Yeah. You know. so, so what is it that, um, uh, how do you say, so I, I think, it, but I think you have to, you have to see it from a very objective. So for example, a point of view. So for example, when in, in the UK, when I was doing a lot of workshops for designers when developing projects, I would think about, if I'm going to put, th this is what we aim to design. This is the area that we need to design. So then I would put together a group of design partners who could illustrate difficulties, okay? So um, the, the thing I often tell is this, uh, this uh, project that I did for the redesign of a Band-Aid, you know. A, a, and in that Band-Aid, uh, I thought about, okay, who can teach the designers what they need to know? So in the group, there was a, a person who was blind, a person who was, had a jakshi, who had low vision. There was a person with severe arthritis. Um, there, and who else was there? There's a couple of people with severe... Uh, there was a guy with no hands. Yeah, no. And then the last person I put was Tom, a friend of mine who has no arms. Now, the design question that Tom threw to the designers was, how do you put on a sticking plaster if you don't have any arms? 
Now, that's a really interesting design question. And as a result of that, it meant that the designers had to go back to a kind of first principle position. Okay, they had to really think, not just do kind of minor cosmetic enhancements of something that already existed. What they had to do is that they had to really address something totally different that they hadn't done. And of course, they realized as a result of that that the problem was not the sticking plaster. The problem was the secondary packaging. Okay, So the secondary packaging made it difficult to access the plaster. So what they did is that they repackaged it uh, very much like cigarette uh, in a loop so that it could be plucked and placed like that. Okay? Um, and uh, I mean, it was just a brilliantly simple idea. So that's a kind of... Uh, but that was forced by having somebody with an extreme disability that could pose the right question. Okay? So I think that when you're designing, you need to have design partners who can throw good questions at you. Okay? And you actively seek them out. And in, in this workshop, you've got great design partners because all of the, the scenarios that you're dealing with are extreme scenarios. So you have to be nimble and creative in the way in which you address them. OK? Yeah. OK, thank you very much for wonderful discussion and wonderful answers. Q&A, yeah. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah Q&As. And uh, now, so it's time to... Yeah, uh, we're close. perfectly on yeah. time. Yeah. 60 Amazing. seconds left. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, we're on time and we had a deep discussion, so I think it's mission accomplished. <laughs> yeah, I really uh, appreciate, we really appreciate the whole audience, it's great audiences and translators, sign language translators, English, Japanese translators. Everything. Everything. <laughs> and... <laughs> Uh, Julia Kasim Sensei. <laughs> Again, uh, thank you very much, Julia Kasim Sensei. Thank you very much.